questions for reflection. As the years of my life have unfolded, the impact of St. Paul's conversion and his life and the legacy which he left us in his letters to the early church have all shaped my own vocation and informed my way of life as a Christian. They continually challenge me to say yes to the Lord at a deeper and deeper level. After all, my life, your life, just like St. Paul's life, is a call to continuing conversion. After participating in the martyrdom of the deacon Stephen, and while still breathing murderous threats against the followers of the way, the name which was used to describe Christians until they were called Christians, see Acts chapter 11, this rabbi named Saul encounters the light of God, Jesus Christ, who speaks to him. On his journey, as he was nearing Damascus, a light from the sky suddenly flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, sir? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, as far as we can know, Saul had never physically met Jesus, at least during our Lord's earthly ministry. Yet so identified was Jesus with the church, which is his body, that he asked this profound question of Saul. When Saul persecuted the members of the body of Christ, he persecuted Jesus himself. Jesus and his church are one. Saul's experience on the way to Damascus and his ongoing life of responding to the invitation of Jesus form a framework for his ongoing conversion, as well as his apostolic mission in the Lord and for his church. They also remind all of us that conversion is an ongoing call, which requires a response from us. Have we given our response? The psalm response for today's Holy Mass is short, but gets to the most important point. Alleluia, praise Yahweh, all nations, extol him, all peoples, for his faithful love is strong and his constancy never ending. Just as the Lord's faithful love is strong and constant, our response to him should be the same. Again, Paul is an example to follow. Paul suffered and underwent deprivation in daily life. He was misunderstood and betrayed by brethren. He experienced intense emotional, economic, and physical hardships. He had reasons to become bitter. He did not. He became better. That's our challenge as we embark on our own Christian life. Because of his close communion with Jesus, the one who had called him in the desert, Paul had the interior strength that only comes from living a fully surrendered life. The Lord who called him had changed him in the encounter. This is reflected, as is often the case in the biblical accounts of vocational callings, with the change of his name from Saul to Paul. But this change, the ongoing conversion, continued as Paul learned to empty himself so that he could be filled up with God. So it is meant to be in our lives. In our lives, we will suffer. We will be misunderstood, betrayed by friends, shipwrecked, at least figuratively, and suffer the instability that often accompanies the struggles of daily life. Paul shows us the way to choose the better way, the way of discipleship. Our gospel text is the continuation of the discourse on the bread of life from the very words of Jesus recorded by the Apostle John. And they contain this crystal clear statement, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in that person. There can be no doubt from the very words of Jesus and the words of the early church that the early Christians took the claims of Jesus that the bread and wine became and still become his body and blood seriously. This is what theology refers to as a mystery, from the Greek word mysterium, which does not mean, as Western minds might think, a puzzle to be solved. Rather, it refers to something which mere words cannot communicate adequately. It must be encountered and received. It's the word from which was derived the word sacrament. The Eastern Church, Catholic and Orthodox, still refer to the sacraments as the mysteries. The Eucharist is the sacrament of sacraments, the mystery of mysteries. We receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. The Apostle Paul explained to the Corinthians, and I quote, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? 
because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. 1 Corinthians 10. And I quote, For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he's betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. That's 1 Corinthians 11. The teaching continued and cannot be denied. For example, St. Justin Martyr wrote in 167 AD, and I quote, This food we call the Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake except one who believes that the things we teach are true and has received the washing for forgiveness of sins and for rebirth, and who lives as Christ handed down to us. For we do not receive these things as common bread or common drink, but as Jesus Christ our Savior, being incarnate by God's word, took flesh and blood for our salvation, so also we have been taught that the food consecrated by the word of prayer, which comes from him, from which our flesh and blood are nourished by transformation, is the flesh and blood of that incarnate Jesus." End quote. Do we truly believe that when we come forward at Holy Mass and partake of Holy Communion, we receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ? If so, what does that mean for how we live our lives every other day of the week?